Today, two Australias for the 16th of July 2021. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In today's post, we look at the latest construction data, examine the two camps in the real estate market and beyond, who might get mortgage relief during the lockdowns as Victoria joins the party, and then we revisit the New Zealand situation with forecasts of home price falls in the light of the latest CPI. And finally, we we'll look at the upcoming US debt ceiling and how that may play out and into the broader questions about inflation. And this post is supported by Ruben Property Consultants. The number of new houses that commenced construction in the March 2021 quarter was over 40% higher than the same time last year. According to the latest data from the ABS, building activity figures for the March quarter have revealed that the seasonally adjusted estimate for the total number of dwelling units commenced rose by 0.2% to 51,662 dwellings. This was driven by a 5.9% increase in the number of new detached housing commencements, which was a 20-year high, actually, of 35,869, and that followed a 27.1% rise in the December quarter. New house commencements surged by 40.2% in the March 21 quarter, compared with the March 2020 quarter. Total dwelling units rose by 13.1% compared with the same time last year. But however, new private sector other residential buildings, which includes multi-units, slumped by 11.3% in the March quarter and is 23.8% compared with the March 2020 quarter to 14,667 dwellings. The season adjusted value of total building work done rose 3% in the March 21 quarter to $30.4 billion, but this marked a 1.1% decline compared with the same period in 2020. The quarterly rise was driven by new residential building work done, which was up 4.8% in the March quarter to $16.2 billion in a season adjusted terms, and that's marking a 2.6% rise from the March quarter. Alterations and additions to residential buildings surged both in the March 21 quarter, 11.4%, and compared to the same time last year at 18.5%, to a total of $2.9 billion. And work done on new houses rose 12.1% to $10.1 billion, while new other residential building fell 5.2% to $6.1 billion. But non-residential building declined in the March quarter, down 1.4%, and from the same time last year was down 9.6% to $11.3 billion. Housing Industry Australia economist Angela Lillicrap commented that the record volume of home building was expected and is supporting employment across the economy. But she observed that compared with the beginning of 2020, when there was a slowdown in the amount of work entering the construction pipeline, builders are now dealing with a different set of challenges, including labour, and material shortages. These constraints are expected to ease going into 2022 as the number of new houses commenced construction slows, she said. The HIA's analysis of ABS data found that Western Australia saw the largest increase in detached commitments, up by 136% compared with the same quarter last year, followed by South Australia at 61.7%, the Northern Territory up 59.6%, Tasmania up 50.7%, the ACT up 50%, New South Wales up 37.5%, Queensland up 28.8%, and Victoria just 14.6% higher. And Ms Lillicrap also noted the stark divergence between the detached and multi-unit markets, with multi-unit commencements plunging to their lowest level in the March quarter since June 2012. Multi-unit commencements have fallen by almost 50% since their last peak in March 2018 and are 53.4% lower than their record peak in March 2016, she said. The multi-unit market is expected to remain constrained until there is greater certainty surrounding the return of overseas migration. And of course, the real truth here is that this is a direct reaction to massive government stimulus with Home Builder 
and other support programs at the state level. Now, of course, swallowing the elephant here is going to be the problem insofar that we now we don't have enough builders, we can't get the materials, and I've also heard a lot of stories of people finding that their building contract has been increased because of rising costs. This has a long way to play out and is not necessarily that positive. Elsewhere, Australia's property market might be creating two distinct camps within the real estate marketplace as homeowners and renters are increasingly cast apart from each other. A recent study from CoreLogic showed how it is now cheaper to buy than to rent in many areas of Australia, particularly in regional areas, but in those same areas vacancy rates are so low that it's nearly impossible to rent affordably. In some parts of regional Australia, rents have tripled within the last year. In Townsville, for example, it is cheaper to buy than rent in 94.6% of properties, whereas in suburban Sydney that's only true for around 1% of homes. For those tied to a physical location because of work or lifestyle commitments, such as key workers, owning a home is now a distant dream. Thus, two Australias are created, those already on the property market and those without hope of ever making it on. It's a two-sided coin, explained Dr Mardi Somo, chief economist at PRD in Brisbane. The calculations where it is cheaper to buy than to rent do work out from a mathematical perspective when you're breaking down the costs. A lot of these assume that you have the 20% deposit, that you're working with the current home loan rate, and also that you're taking a 25 or 30 year mortgage. If you do the calculations and you have those assumptions, working out the monthly repayment, and then you break it down on a week by week basis, it can be cheaper than a weekly rent because of the shortage of supply at the moment. Dr. Marcidibo has spoken to Australian broker before about what she called the catch-22 of Australian government housing policy, which has seen incentives to get first home buyers into the property market via subsidies on deposits, but which could potentially leave them with dangerously overbalanced mortgages. However, it's not going to be the case for Australians who can't put the 20% together and have other concerns like bad credit or other reasons where they can't get a loan and they can't find a place to rent either, she said. So you have two sides of the story. Those who can buy instead of rent will be able to capitalise, but those who can't buy are going to struggle to find a place to rent and to afford that rent. That's the two Australias. It all comes down to your choice of location and your flexibility regarding work. If your work will allow you to move somewhere more affordable and you can find somewhere to rent, then you can live somewhere. It's theoretically a good idea to give up a Sydney apartment, for example, to be able to rent in a cheaper place in a regional area. But to actually make that happen is another thing. You've got to work and you've got to be able to find a place where there is infrastructure that allows you to do that and maintain that lifestyle. At the moment, because of the shortage in regional areas, it's possible that the rent is almost equal to the amount that you would need to pay in Sydney. And you have to weigh that up. Yes, you might pay $50 less in a regional area, but will you have the same lifestyle that you're used to? Now, according to MPA, borrowers looking for mortgage relief or help with small business loans during the continuing COVID-19 lockdown will need to prove that their circumstances have changed in order to get a deferral. This year, banks will deal with customers' issues on a case-by-case -case basis, offering options such as moving to interest-only payments for a time, restructuring the loan or partial repayments, plus drawdown facilities, according to The Australian. That differs from 2020 when lenders deferred mortgage repayments, no questions asked. Experts said that homeowners need to act fast to speak with their lender if they expect to struggle with their mortgage. Assistance will be available to all small businesses and home loan customers who have demonstrated they have been significantly impacted by current lockdowns or by a slower recovery from recent lockdowns, a spokesperson for the Australian Banking Association said. Given the various arrangements customers have with their bank, the best advice is call your bank about what relief might be available to you. Don't wait until you're in over your head. Australian banks stand ready to assist. Lockdown impacted customers of Commonwealth Bank don't need to provide evidence to secure a short-term deferral 
according to the Australian. However, they will be asked a series of questions to clarify their situation and CBA's team will educate the customer on what the deferral will mean for them, a spokes person said. Now, over in New Zealand, Statistics New Zealand says that the consumer price index rose 1.3% in the June quarter, a rise which was far more than economists expected, and that gave an annual inflation of 3.3%, which is the highest rate of inflation since 2011, but that was affected by the one-time increase in GST. In terms of what we described as natural inflation, the June quarter rate rise was actually the highest since 2008 as the global financial crisis hit. Price increases were widespread, with 10 of the 11 main groups in the CPI basket having higher prices on average than a year ago. There was a 4.6% jump in new house building costs, and that's the highest since 1987. Economists had expected annual inflation to come in somewhere between 2.8 and 3%, so an August RBNZ rate rise now seems all but a done deal. ANZ senior economist Miles Workman and economist Finn Robertson said the extremely strong inflation figure absolutely confirms our view that the official cash rate will need to be lifted in August, given the economy is at risk of becoming dangerously overheated. And as more banks lift rates, Westpac's acting chief economist believes smaller rises in interest rates could have a significant impact on house prices. In Westpac's latest Home Truths newsletter, the bank's acting chief economist Michael Gordon said a little could go a long way when it comes to interest rate hikes, to the extent that loan-to-value limits and the current tax changes have cooled investor demand, the evidence to date suggests that owner-occupiers have been willing to step into the breach and pay these kinds of prices, he said. That could change once mortgage rates, in particular the popular one- and two-year fixed rates, start to rise from their loans as the prospect of an OCR hike comes into the horizon. We're now expecting the Reserve Bank to increase the OCR by 25 basis points in August, with a further series of hikes over the coming years, but we expect the pace to be gradual. While we haven't seen an OCR increase since 2014, there's a more recent example that could be instructive. They said fixed-term mortgage rates rose between late 2016 and early 2017 in response to global interest rate trends, with one- and two-year rates rising by 30 to 40 basis points. House price growth slowed markedly at the time from around 15% a year in late 2016 to just 4% by the end of 2017. Auckland prices even began to fall slightly, he said. So Westpac is forecasting that house price growth will continue to slow over the next few months, but the annual rate of price growth is likely to still be around 19% by the end of the year. But by the second half of 2022, they expect this to tip over into a period of modest price declines as interest rates return to more normal levels, they said. An easing in financial market conditions have led some to speculate that this gives the Fed more flexibility to begin tapering their next monthly asset purchases sooner. But Moody's does not agree, because a lot of technical factors are putting downward pressure on the 10-year Treasury yield, and this impact will fade and tapering earlier than markets are pricing would risk causing yields to jump when some of the technical drags are eased, they said. The 10-year Treasury yield recently dropped below 1.4%, and it may be difficult for it to mount a significant comeback over the next few weeks, introducing additional downside forecast risk for the 10-year yield to average 1.7% this quarter. A factor which may put downward pressure on the 10-year Treasury yield in the US is the US debt ceiling. On August the 1st, the US debt limit which is the legal maximum amount of outstanding Treasury debt, will be reinstated following a two-year suspension. August the 1st is not a hard deadline for lawmakers to address the debt limit because the Treasury can draw down its cash balance and employ an array of accounting gimmicks to stay within the debt limit. However, the Treasury can't forestall breaching the debt limit indefinitely. So Moody's estimate that if Congress idly stands by, the Treasury will eventually hit the debt limit by around October the 18th. The consequences will be severe. 
they expect the Treasury to have a cash balance of around $450 billion by the 1st of August based on the latest quarterly refunding statement. This is where some downward pressure on the 10-year Treasury yield will occur. Currently, the Treasury's general account at the Fed is at $753 billion. The Treasury will have a few weeks to reduce its cash balance. And the Treasury can't increase its cash balance ahead of the debt ceiling as it will be viewed as circumventing the borrowing limit. As the Treasury spends money from its general account, the cash ends up on the bank's balance sheets, often in the form of money market funds. However, with short-term rates extremely low and threatening to fall below zero, some have opted to put those funds in the Fed's reverse repo facility, even though it pays 0%. There are a number of other technical factors pulling the US 10-year lower recently, including the dearth of Treasury issuance and short coverings. More fundamental factors pushing rates lower is the fading reflation trade, concerns about the Delta variant of COVID-19 and peak US growth. And Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said it was still too soon to scale back the central bank's aggressive support for the US economy while acknowledging that inflation has risen faster than expected. At our June meeting, the committee discussed the economy's progress towards our goals since we adopted our asset purchase guidance last December, Powell told the House Financial Services Committee on Wednesday. While reaching the standard of substantial further progress, it is still a way off. Participants expect that progress will continue. Powell was peppered throughout the three-hour virtual hearing with questions from both Republicans and Democrats on rising prices. Critics say inflation is being fanned by the Fed, holding interest rates near zero while buying $120 billion of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities every month. Powell stressed that while officials expect high inflation to be temporary, they would react if inflation turned out to be persistently and material above their 2% target. There's nothing in the guidance or our framework that would prevent us from doing the right thing at the right time, he said. Powell is trying to push back on this idea that they are under pressure to exit or that they have decided to taper soon, said Priya Misra, head of global rates trash at TD Securities in New York. He said the labour market has a long way to go. Republicans asked Powell to explain how monetary policy could ease supply bottlenecks blamed for rising prices or if the Fed's bond buying was distorting financial markets. Powell said that he'll be watching to see if labour supply increases as enhanced unemployment benefits expire in coming months, adding that he was willing to look through the current shortages and effects on wages and prices if necessary. Even after this supply comes, it is still likely that we will still be short of maximum employment, Powell said. That is why we don't see that it is time to raise rates now. One of the most striking features of Powell's testimony is these supply bottlenecks in the labour market are going to resolve said Nathan Sheets, chief economist at PGIM Fixed Income in Newark, New Jersey. He is stating that more with a period at the end of it rather than a question mark. In my mind, it is more of a question mark. Ten-year Treasury yields edged lower to around 1.35% as Powell testified and US stocks closed near all-time highs. And government data released on Tuesday showed prices paid by U.S. consumers surged in June by the most since 2008, up 5.4% from the same month last year. Strong demand in sectors where production bottlenecks or other supply constraints have limited production has led to especially rapid price increases for some goods and services, which should partially reverse as the effects of the bottlenecks unwind, Powell said. And he also noted that asset prices and risk appetite have risen while downplaying any near-term risks to the economy from financial markets. Powell's remarks before Congress this week are his last semi-annual testimony before President Joe Biden decides whether to give him another four years at the Fed or pick someone else. Powell's tenure as chair expires next February. The Fed's policy patience is part of a new framework it announced nearly a year ago that pledged to achieve an average of 2% inflation over time and not prejudge the level of maximum employment. Forecasts released by Fed officials last month also showed them pulling the timing of interest rate lift off forward with two increases penciled in for 2023, a move that pushed some market measures of inflation expectations lower. 
Measures of longer term inflation expectations have moved out from their pandemic lows and are now a range that is broadly consistent with the FOMC's longer run inflation goal, Powell said in his opening remarks. And both Republicans and Democrats quizzed him about high prices and the Fed's assessment of these increases would not be persistent. Powell said recent readings on inflation had been higher than expected and hoped for, but stressed the largest gains stemmed from a small group of goods and services. On the other hand, if high inflation persisted and it was threatening to uproot inflation expectations, we would actually change our policy as appropriate, he said. And Powell emphasised that the labour market recovery was still far from complete. Conditions in the labour market have continued to improve, but there is still a long way to go, Powell said, adding that despite substantial improvements for racial and ethnic groups, the hardest hit groups still have the most ground left to regain. The US economy added 850,000 jobs in June. That's the biggest monthly increase since August last year. Still, broader measures of labour market slack indicate it is still short of the Fed's mandate of maximum employment. The jobless rate for black workers stood at 9.2%, compared to 6% in February 2020. So we continue to see this tussle between inflation as short-term versus inflation as long-term. But I remind you again, the critical thing to look at is the amount of net stimulus in the economy. As I highlighted, reverse repos are sucking liquidity out. And Yellen is still talking about more fiscal stimulus. So I think there's a lot to play out yet. I certainly am not convinced that inflation is yet structural. But for some, the signs are getting quite strong. And I guess for some, the chance of a policy misstep ahead is actually rising. Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultants standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high. Price discovery and price transparency are hard to find. And then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so... Why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.